to Srila Vyasdev, the author, and to Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual master. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Vasai Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamade Namaste Sarasati Deve Kauravani Pachana Nyi Visesha Sunyavali Paskita Adesha Srila Prabhupada Ki Hare Krishna So, first is text 13, first one. There we go. And then there was like. Did you want to close? No, that's okay, right there's good. Thanks. Uh Kasmango. Kasmango. Nama. Rajashir. Kathmango. Nama Rajashir. Yadve Yat. Tam yadve yatam iha iha yusha yadve yatam iha yusha muhurtat sarvam utrija muhurti muhurtat Sarva Utsrija Katavan Abhayam Harim Katavan Abhayam Harim So Katvango Nama Raja Yadvi Yatam Iha Yusa Yadvi Yatam Iha Yusa Muhurta Sarvam Utsrija Muhurta Sarvam Utsrija Katavan Avayam Harim Katavan Avayam Harim Katvango Nama Rajasir Katvango Nama Yadvi Yatam Iha Yusa, Sadve Yatam Iha Yusa, Uhurtat Sarvam Utrija, Uhurtat Sarvam Utrija, Katavan Havayam Harem, Katavan Havayam Harem, Katvangu Nama Rajasir, Katvangu Nama Rajasir. I've been there. Yat, 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 ve, yatam, iha, yusa. Yat, ve, yatam, iha, yusa. Muhu, 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 yatat, sarvam, utrija. Muhu, tat, sarvam, utrija. Go, go, tavan, abhayam, harem. Yatavan, abhayam, harem. Okay, so someone else. Katvat go nama rajasa. Katvam go nama rajasir. Katve yatam iha sisaha. Katve tam iha yusaha. Bhutartha sarva utsi shrija. Murhutha sarva mutrija. Yatavan haviyam harim. Katavan Havayam Harim and Alupriya. Katvango Nama Raja Shir. Katvango Nama Raja Shir. Yatve Yatam Ihayusha. Yatve Yatam Ihayusha. Muhur Tat Sarva Mutsrija. Muhur Tat Sarva Mutsrija. Katavan Havayam Harim. Katavan Havayam Harim.
saintly king. Saintly king. Yatva. Yatva. By knowing. By knowing. Iha. Iha yatam. Iha yatam. Duration. Duration. Iha. Iha. In this world. In this world. Ayusa. Ayusa. Of one's life. Of one's life. Muhurat. Muhurat. Excuse me, it's muhurat. Muhutat. Within only a moment. Within only a moment. Sarva. Sarva. Yeah. Sarva. Everything. Everything. Utsvija. Leaving aside. Leaving aside. Katavan. Katavan. Had undergone. Had undergone. Abhya. Abhayam. Abhayam. Fully saved. Fully saved. Karim. Karim. The personality of God in it. The personality of God in it. By the way, all boys do Gornitais and Sisi Radha Kanta's dressers and the garland makers. That's very nice. That's what we're So, um, I'll read it and we'll repeat it. The saintly king Katvanga, after being informed that the duration of his life would be only a moment more, at once freed himself from all material activities and took shelter of the supreme safety of the personality of God. I, I didn't read the one before, so I was wondering. What is, the what is the value of a prolonged life which is wasted in experience by years in this world? Better a moment of full consciousness because that gives one a start in searching after his supreme interest. So then it says, the saintly king Katvanga, after being informed that the duration of his life would be only a moment more, at once freed himself from all material activities and took shelter of the supreme safety of the personality of God. Now I'll say it and you can repeat it. Uh, the saintly king Katvanga. The saintly king Katvanga. After being informed. After being informed. That the duration of his life that the duration of his life would be only a moment more would be only a moment more at once at once free himself free himself from all material activities from all material activities and took shelter of the supreme safety and took the shelter of the supreme safety the personality of Godhead the personality of Godhead Purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. A fully responsible man should always be conscious of the prime duty of the present human form of life. The activities to meet the immediate necessities of material life are not everything. One should always be alert in his duty for attainment of the best situation in the next life. Human life is meant for preparing ourselves for that prime duty. Maharaj Kadvanga is mentioned herein as a saintly king because even within the responsibility of the state management, he was not at all forgetful of the prime duty of life. Such was the case with other Rajarsis, saintly kings, like Maharaj Yudhisthira and Maharaj Parikit. There were all, they were all... Um, exemplary personalities on account of their being alert in discharging their prime duty. Maharaj Katvanga was invited by the demigods in the higher planets to fight demons. And as a, as a king, he fought the battles uh, to the full satisfaction of the demigods. The demigods, being fully satisfied with him, wanted to give him some benediction for material enjoyment. But Maharaj Katvanga being very much alert to his prime duty, inquired from the demigods about his remaining duration of life. This means that he was not uh, as anxious to accumulate more, some material benediction from the demigods as he was to prepare himself for the next life. He was informed by the demigods, however, that his life would last only a moment longer. The, boy, that was... Pretty few, you know, it was a, it was a real uh, great timing. <laughs> the king at once left the heavenly kingdom, which is always full of material enjoyment of the, and of the highest standard, and coming down to this earth. Uh, you see, 
The king at once left the heavenly kingdom, which is always full of material enjoyment of the, of the highest standard, and coming down to the surf, took ultimate shelter of the old safe personality of Godhead. I mean, that's actually, I just sort of, the dawn hit me that he's in the heavenly planet, the heavenly kingdom, and they're asking him, what benediction would you like? And he's surrounded by the heavenly <laughs> celestial uh, pleasures that are vast. And he's not allured by it. Like he could be right in the middle of this the most, um, all the possible uh, uh, gratifications of the senses in the highest form. And yet he still is fixed in understanding that this life is temporary. And that my real duty is to prepare for the exit, to go back home, back to God. That, you know, is quite remarkable. I mean, even if a devotee sometimes just gets a small inheritance or something, um, or, you know, anyone, they just immediately become bewildered. <clears throat> what to speak of these people that win lottery tickets? I mean, they just completely... It's becoming more and more of the fashion now that people don't want to... They want to be anonymous, and they have to sue in order to remain anonymous because they're afraid of all the, um, all of the um, envious uh, people that will come after them with lawsuits and so on and so forth. Somebody's just won a big lottery ticket and they're suing their own son. Mm. And uh, I remember actually, you know, and I'll get back to the prayer, but I remember actually one of the very first winners of a lottery when we were in Atlanta, it was probably about 30 years ago, and you know, in the South, they would like, there's no way we're going to, especially in Mississippi, I, that's why I was so surprised when I came back here in the late 1990s, after not being here for maybe a dozen years or so, you know, I used to be here a lot in the 70s and 80s, because my son was going to school here, and then I, I, uh, to Canada, and so, on. so then I came back, and I, I couldn't believe there were casinos, and not just one, but there was because they would never. And what to speak? They had uh, they also what to speak of lotteries they had casinos, and they were so there's never going to be. This is not this is not Christian. It's not biblical. And uh, so anyway, I remember in Atlanta, somebody in Augusta, I believe it was one of the first people to win a lottery ticket. He became so excited. Literally within a few moments after winning it, he died of a heart attack. <laughs> no. I, well, that was my reaction. I mean, I, it's like he got so excited. But it reminds you of this that Mars Katvanga is like, he's got, you know, he's surrounded by all this incredible heavenly delights. And they say, you ask for any benediction you want. And he says, well, I want to know how much longer I got to live. You know, so and they don't worry about that because they, they they consider themselves the immortals because their lifetimes are so vast. I mean, in in Brahma Loka, the topmost planet, it's like four or ten trillion or something ridiculous. And the, but there's one um, Mar Loka, which is one of the it's above uh, Indra Loka. They they live for I think it was four billion so many hundreds of millions of years. You know, so these, these are like vast periods of time. And th th that's not by our time calculation, that's by their time calculation, which would be even longer, I believe. Maybe that is calculated into our times. But in any case, so they feel like, you know, I don't have to worry about that. And so, and he, I, they don't even grow old. Anyway, um, I got sidetracked, sorry. But, I'll uh, just keep going. So the king at once left the heavenly kingdom, which is always full of material enjoyment of the highest standard, and coming down to this earth, took ultimate shelter of the all-safe personality of Godhead. Um, he was successful at his great attempt and achieved liberation. This attempt, even for a moment, by the saintly king, was successful because he was always alert to his prime duty. Mars Brickett was thus encouraged by the great Sukadeva Goswami, even though he had only seven days left 
on his life, in his life, to execute the prime duty of hearing the glories of the Lord in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. By the will of the Lord, Mara's Brikit instantly met the great Sukadev Goswami and the great treasure of spiritual success left by him is nicely mentioned in the Shimma Bhagavatam. Yeah, so because he was such a, uh, an advanced soul, he set the, the stage for this great scripture to be uh, spoken and, and for us to have and to hold, to cherish and to uh, uh, imbibe so that we too can have the same success in our human form of life. So the, the saintly king Kadvanga, after being informed by the, about that the duration of his life would be only a moment more, at once freed himself from all material activities and took shelter of the supreme safety of the personality of Godhead. Om again to Mananda Shakyana Namasalakaya Chaksu Vimalita Jaina Tazma Shri Guru Maham so, uh, you know, what, what is, um, well, there was a lot of things running through my mind when I was reading it, uh, but um, how to capture all those thoughts in a, you know, in a, in a way that makes sense. Um, but I was, one, the one thing I was reminded of is that, is with you, in this, Scripture, we're being told about kings who are great, not because of their accomplishments in conquering. Like in the West, we've been raised in our histories to admire people like Alexander the Great or Napoleon. And why, why do they call him the Great? What did he do that was great? He conquered, did he conquer death? No. He conquered other, other um, civilizations, other, you know, tribes or countries. And uh, because, were they aggressors? Well, maybe in one case, some, I think, the Persian had killed his father. But even then, I don't think they were, the Persians were aggressors. I think his father was. So, but he wanted to, he, there was revenge involved. But he started off with other smaller states and, you know, perfected his art of conquering so that he could be great at it. Um, so he, he, we say he's out. And Napoleon. And why was Peter great? Peter the Great. Gotcha? Is it a Russian national Yeah. Uh, because he, like, for Russia, he opened America and he, I mean, for, for us, he opened. Europe. Oh yeah, he wanted, that's right, he, he became, he, he, he wanted to, they have been more isolated and he introduced many of the things that he had learned in Europe and wanted to uh, bring in um, art and education and things like that, so that, that, but it was all material though, it was just another form of sense gratification. So, okay, he was, he wasn't just known for conquering, but he was known for introducing um, a type of culture, but that culture was just another form of sense gratification. So the people that uh, we have Napoleon, we have all these, um, who else? Attila the Hun, he was a great. So the histories of the so called great kings or warriors are. They're warriors, that's what they are. They're great at conquering, they're great at, and whether it's, it's in the act of defense or whether it's just um, their greed and their lust for power. So, that's what we study. We, our history is a history of wars. You know, I can remember it specifically, like say, just with America, we start with the Revolutionary War, there's the French and Indian War, there's, um, you know, there's, the Battle of 18, or the War of 1812, and there's uh, the Mexican-American War, there's always in American and Indian Wars, um, the, you know, there was, uh, Civil War? Yeah, there's, yeah, there was, this, there was the Civil War, um, there was the First, uh, First World War, before that though, in the 1890s, there was 
something. I guess there was another war with, yeah, with uh, that was the Mexican-American War, uh, 1880s, 1870s, something like that. No, that was earlier, because that was Andrew Jackson. But we had a lot of wars down in that area with Indians. And so, um, you know, there was just one war after another. And that's how we study our history, that's how we know, how we mark our history. Um, and then, and then, you know, other people may be known because they uh, have, you know, discovered something in science, like Newton's law of gravity. Well, it's not actually Newton's law. Newton discovered a law in the creation that was, uh, is attributed to the Creator. He just discovered something that was already in place. He didn't create the law of gravi gravity. Um, even the, the, like say, you take someone like I, uh, Einstein, you know, his whole theory of rel uh, relativity, that, um, that's something that he observed or he speculated on and he used math to come up with uh, a, a, a theory of relativity. So what they find is things that are already existing. And what do they find it with? With a brain that is given to them, and senses that are given to them by someone else. Nothing uh, in this uh, world belongs to us. We are stewards of, say, we have a realm, a field of activity, where we are given an opportunity to utilize it in the service of the Lord, or we can exploit it, the resources, for our own personal gratification. And, but we, while we're in our, in this life, we think that this place is ours. This is America, which we stole from the Native Americans. And, um, but it, it didn't belong to the Native Americans either. It was, this land was here before these different, uh, uh civilizations were here. And it, the land will remain after they have come and gone. They'll just be dust in the wind, as they say. Um, and they may last a generation or two, but that gradually people won't remember them. You know, they, they won't remember these things. 10,000 years from now, who's going to know about America? I mean, I, you know, I don't know how the Kali Yuga is going to de develop, but we, they're always finding out about you know, they didn't even know about certain civilizations. They don't even know, really. Um, it's becoming more and more apparent, but because of things by Saddam Putta's books and others, uh, it's becoming more and more apparent that there was some great civilization in this, these rumors, this myth of an Indian culture, an empire, a Vedic culture, that was all over the world. And it explains a lot of things that are presently unexplainable. But, in fact, they don't actually teach that, and mainstream um, archaeology or history doesn't accept it. They don't even know about it, that the fact that the Mahabharata is not, is not just some mythology. And that was a fantastic, incredibly advanced civilization with technologies that we today haven't, um, would you know, love to be able to uh, acquire. So, but when we're here, that not only is, do we th and so the point is that the land belongs to someone else, it belongs to the Creator. But we think it's ours. And not only that, but the body itself, our body, the tool that we use, I call it my body, but all the elements of this body is a, is a gift from, say, let's just say my mother and father, you know, and, or, but then you can go on a, another level from Mother Nature. And then, well, if there's a mother nature, then who's the father? I probably used to say, if a man doesn't know, or a woman doesn't know who their father is, they're called bastards. And they don't know who their father is. The civilization, they don't know. They may say, sometimes they may actually have the concept that there's God, and they say God, but what is God's name? There was that one... Um, uh, TV interview, the Churu 
Prabhu talks about, I believe it was in Australia, and there was this, there was a, this person was famous or infamous for tearing his um, guests to shreds, humiliating them. And that is confirmed. <laughs> it's okay. No <laughs> problem. And, and um, so, when he found, so Prabhupada comes out and he has a picture of Krishna. I think it was the Gopal Krishna, the famous one. You know, where, um, you know, from, uh, what's his name? B, 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 something Sharma? Yeah, with the little, little calf. And he's sitting on a rock. And, uh, so, then, and there was a kind of thing that used to be called like a, a love seat, where it, it's like there's a seat here, and then it's like an S, and another seat there. But Prabhupada put the picture of Krishna next to him, like that, walked out. And Prabhupada's looking, well, well thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, so when, when this interviewer saw the picture of Krishna, and, uh, and Prabhupada thought, oh, this is red meat for me, I'm going to rip him up. <laughs> and then uh, he said, so, who's that? And he said, this is Krishna. And he said, so that's your God? He said, this is God, and his name is Krishna. And, um, you know, he tells him that he uh, likes to play the flute, he um, likes cows and tends cows, and he lives with his devotees. And he gives the name of the place, Goloka Vrindavan, and he gives him all the basic facts of what his name is, you know, who his friends are, what his occupation or habits are, and the type of music, all of these things. He said, so this is our God. Now, can you tell me about your God? And the guy was like, uh, well, and he was stunned. He said, so, you have nothing. Prophet said, you have nothing. So you must accept that this is God because you don't know anything about God. And the man was completely defeated. You know, I'm not remembering exactly how it was done, uh, but it was to, so basically to that, 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 uh, that was the essence of what transpired between the interviewer and Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada comes right out boldly. Here's a picture of Krishna. This is his name. So, and he's mocking, oh, this is your God. He said, yes, this is God. His name is Krishna. He plays a flute. He likes cows. He lives in Goloka Vrindavan. So now, you tell me about your God. <laughs> well, God is great. Well, that's so, yes. That's all you got? So then you must accept that this is God. Because I have given you information of my God. And you can't give me any information about your God. I mean, he really was like, everyone was shocked. So, the, you know, because Prabhupada just handled it. I don't know what happened after that. But So, um, so God uh, has given us a place to try to um, imitate and become the supreme enjoyer, the supreme proprietor. But, uh, to no avail, because we can't enjoy the material energy, because we're not material, we're spiritual. We can't be happier, and so we're given an opportunity to do so here, and we exploit it in every way possible. We try to squeeze out pleasure in every possible, conceivable way. We try to, uh, we, you know, we try to look for um, things that are going to make us happy. We mine deep into the, into the mountains, then we drill down deep into the ocean, trying to find, you know, valuable resources that will give us more pleasure, but yet still it's not enough. Then we, and we, we try to, all kinds of different activities, things that will give us, will, uh, types of food to eat, and um, ways to live, uh, with either in a city or in the country or in a suburb, we try to create different and design um, intentional communities to make us happy. But in the end, we're never really happy. Scientists come up with little tools and games, video games and and television, so we can watch uh, movies. And still, people are um, 
frustrated and, 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 and unhappy. And, but they don't want us to see people getting old and getting sick. They don't want to know, let us know about people dying. They don't want you to see a man or a woman who has just lost their, their boyfriend or their girlfriend and how upset they are and they want to kill themselves. They, they don't want you to see people that are, you know, crazy because of their addiction to an intoxication. Because they can't find happiness in a place um, that um, is not ours. But we act as if it's ours and will be here permanently. We're going to live here forever. And so Katvanga is the king of the world. He has everything uh, he could possibly Anyone else would be so envious to, to, um, of his wealth and his power and his resources. But he knows it's not his. And he's also now being asked by the demigods, here, ask us for any benediction you want. Look at our beautiful celestial world. You can have any benediction you want. And what does he ask for? Well, how much longer do I have to live? And they say, well, actually... Um, it appears that you only have another moment. Oh, was, thanks for telling me. Because no bank account is going to protect you from death. No kind of... I mean, just, you just think about all the different crazy things that people are doing to, in today's society. I'm not happy being a man, so let me become a woman. I'm not happy being a woman, so let me become a man. I mean, I don't want to like, create any controversy with any, if anyone's having some sexual identity crisis, but um, you know, th th just think about the insanity of that. Just wait the next lifetime and you'll get it. You don't have to go through all the spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and all the pain and humiliation and, and uh, uh, of doing it in this lifetime. It'll happen automatically. But do you think that all men are happy? No! You think all women, and men sometimes are jealous of women. You think women are happy? No! Ultimately, nobody is. They can rationalize you, you can play, you play with your mind and think that you, you have some rationalization, but then to say you, you happen to be blessed with some great talent, or great beauty, or great wealth, and then you see these people, like on the, these, these rags on the, uh, at the uh, cashier's line in, in Walmart and other grocery stores that show you pictures of famous people that were beautiful and yes, yeah, talented and then they're and they're trying to hide because now they've done some plastic surgery to recapture their youth and now they look like lizards <laughs> and, you know, or they, they they can't smile are you smiling are you happy or are you sad yeah i'm fine i'm happy yeah mm -hmm. this had this one plastic uh look it looked like they've been beaten by a bat everything's all swollen and, it's, it's, I mean, when you think about what they do to themselves in order to recapture their youth, that they actually have someone cut their body and take parts of their body uh, from one area and put it in their face. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really quite bizarre. If you, if you, and, and yet, it's like, you know what? What's the problem? You know, a little plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. I saw one, one actress, there was a headline that said, of course you never know, but you see it said, she said, I want my old face back. Because said she had done some plastic surgery, and now she, she looks scary. You know, so I mean, how, how, how insane is it? And it's why do you want to, why do you want to maintain? If, if you are material nature, if we are a product of this material nature, we should be able to just accept the fact that gradually I diminish. But we can't accept that because we are not material. We are spiritual. So we are always youthful. We are not ignorant. We are always full of knowledge. We are not in anxiety. Here we are, but in reality, we are free from anxiety. We have no worries. I remember seeing that sign. I was just arrived in San Francisco, 
and there was a big billboard of Meha Baba uh, on the bridge that went from San Francisco to Berkeley. And it was a big picture of him. And then it said, don't worry, be happy. It was like around 1969 or something. And uh, I started thinking, don't worry, be happy. Well, I'm happy, yeah. I think I'm happy. I mean, what do you mean, don't worry about it? I mean, then I started worrying about whether or not, whether, you know, whether I was really happy. And it, it actually created another worry for me. I didn't even stop to think, well, maybe I'm not happy. I don't know. You know, what is happy? You know, so, um, and what, what is hap makes someone happy uh, may actually cause pain to someone else. Mm -hmm. It may, may make me happy to go hunting and shoot deer. Or like there's a, a, a sport in, up in Tennessee where they go rabbit stomping. Oh. True. Kill with the feet? Yeah, they have these boots. And they go chasing after them. Works. Yeah. I mean, that makes them happy. I just realized I can't say this in, my, uh, in other situations, but today I could say it. <laughs> um, so, but you know, so the, so things that make us happy. What is happiness? But, but real happiness is um, is spiritual. And they have a saying that says, "It's so good, it must be sinful." Mm -hmm. In other words, they think that spiritual life, religious life, is there's no pleasure in it. And it's boring. But, um, but. Um, you know, sinful life, that's what the happiness is, the forbidden fruit. And what is it that makes you, makes you happy is that it's something forbidden that you're not allowed to do. So it's actually the happiness is all in your mind. It's not real happiness and it's fleeting. You can't keep it. And so, uh, uh, Maharaj Katvanga and Maharaj Parikit and Maharaj Yudhisthira, these great kings, they show us by their example that they're real leaders. That if even you have everything, still you're going to lose it and you must prepare. This life is meant for preparing. The human form of life is meant to prepare for the time of death. And so, I think that just about covers I mean, there's more I could say, I suppose, but it's 8.20 something. So I'll leave some time for questions. Colleen? Um, See, <laughs> Colleen was first. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, did I? No, 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 it's just a joke. Because oh. when she oh. speaks, oh. when she sorry. speaks, he speaks oh. first. <laughs> Go, please. No, 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 he didn't raise his hand. Oh, okay. Um, I uh, was listening to something and uh, they said that even the uh, the people who are conservationists or they want this the people to pay attention to this global warming they said uh, the person said we're doing that because they they're doing that because they want to be able to exploit longer <laughs> if we could just Slow down our exploitation, yeah, you know, and, and be good, better stewards of the land, right, so right. that it's there for other people to. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, the other the point, another that I was going to just actually, before you even said it, I was thinking I want to mention the fact. So then, after we've used up this place, now we're thinking that we can go to other planets mm -hmm. and exploit that. And it, like back in the seventies, I think it was, after they had gone to the moon, um, they even, I think there was Pan Am, uh, it was an airline that's gone out of business, they were actually selling tickets to the moon. Mm -hmm. That people are going to go there, because, you know, if you, you, you're not so happy here, you're a little bored with your life here, well, um, let's go to the moon, then you'll really be happy. Go for a vacation in, at the moon. And of course you have to wear a huge bulky suit and, and like this. Uh, just like, you know, people that, uh, there's so many examples of uh, people that, say, plan for a big vacation for two years. 
put the money away, picked out the right exact time, the perfect place to go, with the perfect friend to go with, and then it's supposed to be beautiful weather, like say it's Hawaii or something, and then they get there and it rains all day, every day. And you can't go out and enjoy the beach, you can't go to the places you want to go to, you're stuck inside, or you get sick while you're on your vacation. That you can't create. You know, of course, I'm, I'm sounding very pessimistic, but one has should be pessimistic about this material world because this um, no relationship is going to save you, no matter how strong your family ties are. They're not going to be there when it's time for that last breath. It's going to be you and you only, and your relationship with God, with Krishna. You have to prepare for that now. No one else can help you. No amount of money in the bank can help you at the time of death. You can't buy your way out of it. You know, you can't buy another breath. No uh, medicine, no, nothing you can add to your body, no chemical combination can add anything to you. Don't trust the scientists, don't trust uh, anything in this material world. The only thing you can trust is is God, is Krishna. In God we trust. So you were saying that the conservationists were saying that they really the whole point is that they want to they want to save the planet so we can extend our sense gratification. Right? Is that what you said? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Similar the chemtrails are starting starting to they're starting to admit that it's happening. What? The, the chemtrails. What's that? Where they, the, the jet planes pour out is these nanoparticles, tiny, tiny particles that... I saw the, some this morning. They reflect the sun, and they're supposed to slow down. They're trying desperately to slow down global warming because they, they don't admit it publicly, but they know it's happening, so they're trying to slow it down by reflecting off the sun. That's they're, what they're saying? In order to clouds. Well, I, I, this morning I came out, and I saw two of them yeah. over my head, and I heard there was some conspiracy theory about that maybe they're... Spreading some kind of, you know, diseases that way or something. But you're saying it's, it's, it's nanoparticles like a, a lunar barium or something like that that are reflecting the sun, and um, they have, say other chemicals they say, but they're reflecting the sunlight more. They're supposed to be reducing the global, so we don't have to change our lifestyle, Definitely right? Warm. They're going to do this extra thing, and they're going to postpone the global warming and try to save the planet for further. Exploitation, not going to change the lifestyle, and they're also going to poison the land bit because it's going to settle eventually. And the people. Yeah. And so I, that's interesting. I didn't know that. that it's interesting you mentioned because I, I looked up and I saw these two. I thought, oh, I wonder if that's true about see, these things. You see the sky crisscrossed with clouds and yeah. or something. They I've seen one. I saw one recently where it looked like a Shiva um, tilak. It was just three. Three, and they weren't, you know, say maybe a football field long, parallel to another. I think that's odd. How'd that happen? That's not a, that's not a natural formation, but you know. so. But then also, that's the same thing with certain diseases that are caused by activities, like say smoking or the food they eat or the the type of ways they try to enjoy the body. They try to squeeze pleasure out in every possible way. And they're trying to squeeze more resources out of the earth in different ways so that, well, we can't dig any more here, so let's try to get it out of the sand, the particles in between the sand. Let's try to get it out by fracking, you know, which then causes possibly, you know, earthquakes. You know, but they just and pollute more pollution. I mean, what really gets me is the irony of it all is, but because of the climate change, the Arctic, uh, the, um, and also the Antarctic, but they're really interested in the North Pole. And um, because the glaciers are melting, mm -hmm. so there's, now there's uh, the opportunity for more drilling of oil. Because now underneath those glaciers, they can get through the water and go down, and they're convinced that there's large pockets of oil up in those northern uh, oceans. There's a lot of countries yeah, a lot of countries like uh, Scandinavian countries, Canada, the US, Russia, Russia um, you know, I think like Sweden and Green they all they're all uh, vying for the control of various slicing up the, the, the North Atlantic Ocean. 
in or the Arctic, water. North Arctic Ocean. In water. And it's caused by burning fossil, not just, well, not just burning fossil fuels. Now I'm, I'm more educated, I realize that the real main culprit is, is, is meat eating. And cows. Yeah, it's, the, it's because they, they have cut all, they've cleared, cut ma major portions of the Amazon and um, they have, so they can have more cattle and for supplying our desire for the eating of cow flesh and that there's a lot of methane created from the cows and that's what creating more of an, uh, a, uh, a hazard to the oxygen and to the what is it the, the covering the ozone covering more than fossil fuel does fuel does uh, apparently, Oprah was trying to uh, educate people about this, yeah. and uh, I guess the, the cattle ranchers union right. came on top of her. And, you know, they were going to sue her for everything. They did sue her. Yeah. They did sue her, but she, but, but now she they won. Made, she won. But now they actually the, the main rancher that was working with her at that time, he says that if I said those very same things now, they pass laws mm -hmm. that I could go to jail because that means it's, you're trying to disturb people's faith in the food chain, mm -hmm. and so you can actually be arrested for, you know, economic damage. You know, some something to do with creating, you know, destroying the faith uh, and our the, the, what they're being supplied within food, so mm -hmm. it's like a treasonous act almost. Mm -hmm. It would be economic damage. Yes, yeah, so, so you actually can go, it's illegal, you, it's a crime. And it's not just a civil thing. You say it was about mad cow disease, was it? You can't say anything about mad cow disease? You can't damage anybody's faith in the food system. No. And also, you can't take pictures anymore. They used to fly private planes over hog yeah. um, production yeah. Yeah, sites yeah. and take pictures of the the pollutants, and if you think this famous case in Michigan, a little old lady was doing it, and she got the word out, and if she did that today, she could go to jail. Well, no in some, some parts of South America, that actually, like there was this one nun, oh, they who killed, was, they just they killed her. Yeah. She was walking home. Coca-Cola. And they, they just, she, they know that she was assassinated, because she uh, was so outspoken about what was going on. So, I mean, but th this is to protect uh, some, uh, some vested interest and to try to um, continue this illusion. And the, even, you know, but there's nothing here. There's nothing, that, all they're doing is increasing their entanglement in suffering. Endless suffering. You know, it says in the Bhagavatam, if I remember correctly, for every hair on the body of a cow, that you, if you eat meat, for every hair on the body of a cow that you eat, you will have to experience a thousand years uh, in this one specific hell, which is where you burn in, in hot oil, cauldrons of oil. And so, when they used to put up these signs, McDonald has sold how many, a billion burgers. Well, just think, a billion cows times how many hairs on the body of a cow? I mean, that, that the, so, um, it's practically forever. So, the, this is, this is what we're up against. And so, like, it really is, prashadam distribution, getting people a higher taste, and having them eat prashadam, um, and getting the Hare Krishna mantra, sound vibration, out into the ether, and getting books distributed um, that give people information, festivals, rathiatras, um, these communities like this, showing people that you can um, have a, a cows and not um, have to slaughter them in order to make it economical, economically viable. Um, this, is, this is the greatest welfare. This is the greatest thing you can do for humanity, what to speak of for yourself. Even if you don't give a hoot about anything or anyone else, you care about yourself. So, save yourself, at least, you know. But, if, but actually, you know, once you, anyone who wants to save themselves, they realize they, 
they have compassion and they want to save others as well. But just like, you know, with, with family, if our family doesn't accept what we're doing, you know, then they may not appreciate in this lifetime what you're doing, but they will at the time of death. If, you're, if you are a success, if you really love your family, then become a successful devotee. You will save your family. Yes, Krishna. It does not to do what we were just talking about. That's okay. When you said be happy, what came to my mind, I was really thinking of how appreciative and grateful I'm still Prabhupada because I'm reading Lita Mika how he had this whole thing of stay high forever, whereas the, the uh, hippies are thinking, oh, I can get high and think I'm God and everything's fine, but then they have to come down and then there's this whole unhappiness that they're going to have right. because of coming down and seeing all the suffering around them. But then it was so nice because then they see they got attracted. They would go to Thompson Square Park and then sit down and they would play all their different instruments. Yeah. And they would listen to Prabhupada and chant. And then they would real, they realize, oh, this is something that I'm not going to come off down of. after. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking that. So. I, I, well, I have to admit that I used to take various intoxicants back then in the late 60s. And, you know, there was one that we would take. It was a psychedelic, and you would get to a place where you'd feel like, say, you know, it wasn't just the question of getting high, it was like, to us at that point, it was like, this was the, the process of self-realization. That's why a lot of us took to Christian, because we were interested in self-realization. And we thought, well, LSD, or mescaline, or whatever, peyote, uh, that would help us become more self Realize, and so you go to a really good place, a really nice, beautiful place where you could watch a sunrise or sunset, beautiful parks and things like that, with the right kind of people, with the right kind of music, and you reach a certain point where you really feel like how much you appreciate nature and the Creator and all living entities, and you feel love for all beings, and and you think, I, I got it now, I, I'll be able to maintain this now, I understand it now, I won't need the pill the next time. I can maintain this. And, you know, about, you know, seven or eight hours later, mm -hmm. you were right back in it. You know, you, you lost it. You didn't have it. And you never did. It was an hallucination. I remember specifically, one time, after I had, it was on Christmas Day, 1970, I went to the, I was getting ready to go to New York, and I had been going out on Harinam with the devotees in San Francisco, so and I had gotten some money. So I wanted to give them a Christmas present, so I went over and gave a hundred dollars. And um, well, that was a lot for me at that point, in 1970. Uh, so, um, Chitsukananda, the president, said, wait right here, I'm going to get you a book. And um, I said, well, I only have the Bhagavad Gita. And, um, was it? He said, no, no, I think there's a new one. So then he had me stand and talk to Jayananda. That was really <laughs> blissful. I didn't know that it was Jayananda until later, but when I saw the picture and then I realized, wow. And what he said was amazing. But so he gives me two Krishna books. So then I go back to where I was staying and stupidly, I went ahead and took some <laughs> something. And um as I, I'm starting to feel the effects of it, I'm looking through the pictures of the Krishna book, and it just took me right out of it. It went, I transcended it, and I could see it as like a cheap carnival thrill. And it wasn't real, it was just some cheap... cheap you mean the drug? Yeah, the drug, the drug, yeah, the drug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the drug. The, because by looking at the transcendental pictures, which are windows to the spiritual sky, mm -hmm. I felt a peace and a pleasure of a serenity, much superior to what I was beginning to experience on this particular, it was mescaline. Um, you know, okay, there I said it. Um, and um, it just seemed like a cheap carnival ride. That was the last time I ever took it. I could see that this was um, much higher much nicer 
you know, it was much, and this, this was something that didn't require doing something illegal or, and mm -hmm. didn't wear off. And no crash. And, and no crash. Yeah, exactly. No crash at all. As a matter of fact, it increases. And so that, that part of it, yeah, stay high forever is real. I mean, actually, uh, for devotees, you know, doing drugs, you're coming down. You're not getting high. You're coming down from the transcendental realm. And nothing material is going to solve anything. I know. So, my wife is pointing to the clock. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, if there's not anything else, so I think I'll end it here then. Okay? Hare Krishna. Thank, Thank you. Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you.